want to continue with Safari, Embrace 2. Today we are on Lesson 2. Amen? Now, a quick recap of what happens in Safari. Safari is an intentional discipleship journey. We discovered that discipleship doesn't just happen by osmosis or by diffusion. It happens by an intentional, deliberate effort to study God's word with uh, other brethren so that you can grow and be rooted and grounded in the word of God. So the safari is an intentional discipleship journey. Safari happens in how many stages? Five. The first one is enter, which is a call to know God. Secondly, the second stage is encounter, which is a call to grow in your faith. The third stage is called embrace, which is a call to bond. So what we are considering this morning is a call to bond, to connect, to relate in the atmosphere of godly love and compassion. The fourth stage is enlist, which is a call to serve. We are saved to serve. And the world is waiting for the church to shine her light and declare the glory of God. And God has called us then to go and serve him and also serve the world and allow ourselves to be the salt and the light of the world. The final stage is Engage, which is a call to go. Go ye therefore into all the worlds, making disciples of every nation, teaching them to obey my commands. Last Sunday, we began Embrace 2 by looking at healthy relationships and fellowship in the congregation. Today, we will be considering the second topic, which is embracing healthy shepherd flock relationship mchungaji na kondor mchungaji na washirika how we can enhance the relationship between the shepherd and the flock an amazing lesson Our aim today, this morning, is to explore and determine key biblical principles for healthy relationships between spiritual leaders and their members and to encourage them to live by the same. The key word here is healthy relationships. This statement presupposes that a relationship between the shepherd and the flock can be unhealthy. Did you know that? Today I'm going to let off the lead of pastoral leadership. Okay? I'm not going to be politically correct. Because I know a shepherd can hurt you. Some of you have been wounded by pastors. Intentionally or unintentionally. But you have also wounded pastors. Can I be real to you? It happens in any relationship. And love relationship. People hurt each other. May God heal us. This is far from being an academic exercise to engage your mind this morning. This is a healing service. That God will heal our relationship. That he may pour his blessings upon this great congregation. Our objective is to gain a clear understanding of biblical principles for cultivating healthy relationships between spiritual leaders and their members. Secondly, appreciate the mutual benefits of healthy relationships between spiritual leaders and their members. And finally, there has to be some action. Commit to, develop, to developing and maintaining healthy relationships with spiritual leaders and all members. Turn to your neighbor and discuss this question. Here at Valley Road, we have great neighbors. Bad neighbors don't come to this church. At least they didn't come today. So you, you have great neighbors. 
and you need neighbors to journey in this safari. In your view, what pitfalls or dangers have you observed in the shepherd flock or leader member relationship? In your view, what pitfalls or dangers have you observed in the shepherd flock or leader member relationship? Engage in just a minute. Amen, amen. Any quick response? Any quick response? Now, this is a rule by, by which we play today. You don't say what you said, you say what your neighbor said. And there's immunity in this service, okay? Nothing will be used against you. Okay. Uh, my neighbor and I discussed uh, that there should be mutual respect. Mm hmm. Normally, uh, a pastor can feel superior, and then maybe you feel inferior. Then whatever he tells you to do, you do out of fear. But what is required is mutual respect. Yeah, you respect me, I respect you. <laughs> now you're spoiling for pastors, Esther. <laughs> okay, another response over there. My name is Nanjala, and my neighbor, we were talking about the fact that we look at pastors and we forget that they're human beings mm. and we need to emulate the example of Paul because my neighbor said, I think he also read the scripture, uh, he said, Paul says, follow me as they follow Christ and the other thing is we have lost the art of the church like the Bereans to fact check pastors and we think that whatever they say is God's law and that's what we discussed as a group. Amen. So what you're saying, Nanjala, is that we are human. As pastors, we are not superhuman. A man of God is still a man. I have, have you seen some ad, advert? The mighty man of God. Who is mighty? Is it the man or God? Upstairs. Hi, my name is Jerry, and we discussed with my, mem my fellow mem members, sorry, Pastors or shepherds sometimes take advantage of congregants. So if I want extra prayers, ongeza kakitu. Angela, we don't do those kind of things. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> we will explore that later. It's very possible that sometimes shepherds can take advantage of the flock. But also the flock can take advantage of. Amen. There you have it. One of the key relationships within the church setting is that between spiritual leaders and their members. In the scriptures, leaders are portrayed as shepherds and members as the flock. The Bible paints several pictures of this shepherd flock relationship and how God expects the relationship to operate. Unfortunately, these relationships have often been either ignored or abused by both the shepherd and the flock. In this lesson, we explore various aspects of this relationship in order to determine how to cultivate a healthy bond between the shepherd and the flock. We have five guiding questions for actually to help us in our discussion this morning. The first question is, what is the significance of the shepherd flock metaphor? Shepherd flock is a metaphor used in the Bible many times. The second question is, how are spiritual leaders expected to conduct themselves as shepherds? The third question we will consider this morning is, what precautions must be taken in, in relating with their members? There should be some precautions so that these boundaries are not broken. And finally, what 
practices members should guard against as they relate with their leaders. Amen? Sounds good? Let's look at the first question. What is the significance of the shepherd flock metaphor? Now, in the Bible, there are many, many, many metaphors. And spiritual leaders are compared to as shepherds and the followers as sheep. I need to remember moving this thing. In the desert plains, particularly, the sheep were totally dependent on the shepherd for pasture. But you know, the goats are not like that. The goats are a bit more hyper, independent. If you want a Kiswahili equivalent, is wajuaji. <laughs> goats can be very naughty, independent, stubborn. But the sheep innocent, dependent on the shepherd for guidance and for direction, for protection, but not so with the, the goats. The shepherd provides shelter, medication, and aid in bathing. The biblical shepherd aided in providing shelter, medication, and in bathing. Likewise, the sheep provided the shepherd with what? Lambs, wool, milk, and meat. So here we see a mutual beneficial relationship. The shepherd takes care of the flock, protects them, feeds them, treats them, but the sheep provides in return lambs, wool, milk, and meat. How do you slaughter a sheep? <laughs> God is regularly referred to us as a caring shepherd. God is referred to us, I mean referred regularly to us as a caring shepherd. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The shepherd will provide for the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Secondly, King David was appreciated as a skillful shepherd. King David was appreciated as a very skillful shepherd. King David is considered to be the foremost leader of Israel, especially because of the way he handled his people. Psalm 78 and verse 2 says, And David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands. He led them. What a king, what a shepherd. He shepherded Israel with integrity of heart with skillful hands he led them Jesus is referred to or rather Jesus referred himself as a good shepherd in several of his teachings Jesus contrasted his leadership with those of the worldly leaders in John 10:11 he says I am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's willing to put his, line, his life on the forefront, on the firing line. Put his life at risk for the sake of the sheep. The church or church leaders are called to be responsible shepherds. The Bible encourages spiritual leaders to shepherd God's flock faithfully and with care. The elders who are among you, I exalt, I encourage, I whom am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Jesus Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. 
not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over the, those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. That speaks to us as your pastors and as a church leadership. The responsibility before us is to faithfully take care of you as a congregation. So you're right in expecting us to be able to feed you, to take care of you, to nurture you so that you can grow to be healthy Christians who are ready to fulfill God's plan and purpose here on earth. The second question we want to consider this morning, congregation, is how are spiritual leaders expected to conduct themselves as shepherds? Spiritual leaders... Spiritual leaders, just like ordinary shepherds, are expected to take care of their flock in every, in, rather in very specific ways. The Bible outlines some of these requirements. Number one, the shepherd, the shepherds are expected to nurture and nourish their flock. I trust that's why you came to church this morning, to be nourished. Not to be malnourished. Spiritually to be fed with the right spiritual diet. I must apologize on behalf of the shepherds in this country. Some of the diet that is being churned out of the pulpit is very unhealthy. It does not nourish you spiritually. Some of it may lead you astray. That's why you need to be careful where you're feeding. The way you feed is reflected how healthy you are. We are expected to nurture and nourish you people. The first and the foremost responsibility of the shepherd is to provide for the flock. The psalmist acknowledged this in relation to God as his shepherd. We've already made mention to this. Psalm 23, 1 to 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. When Jesus was commissioning Peter, he told him to feed the flock. John 21, 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than this? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs, not feed my goats. Feed my lambs, innocent, fragile needing of care, protection, and guidance. That is our responsibility. And you need to hold us to account. You are right in expecting care, pastoral care from us as your leaders. We are charged by God Almighty to take care of you, to feed you, to shepherd you, to protect you, and to make sure that you are well spiritually. That's our responsibility, congregation, as leaders. John 21, 15. We have already made mention to this. Secondly, shepherds should train and guide their flock. Train and guide. All sheep need to be shown the direction and be directed to the right path to follow. It is the task of the leader to provide such guidance. Psalm 23, 3. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Paul points out that various categories of spiritual leaders have been appointed in the church for the purpose of equipping their members. Our responsibility as leaders is to be able to equip you, empower you. It's a trending word 
in, <laughs> in other circles. Empower you. Not disempower you. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We are here to equip you not necessarily to do stuff for you, to do ministry on your behalf. No, that is not biblical. We are not doing ministry on your behalf as a congregation. We are here to equip you. We feed you. We encourage you. We, 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 but we also challenge you to be able to serve God because you have spiritual gifts. We are here to start up those gifts and then be able to position you so you can have greater impact. Church leaders, at least pastors, are not hired to do ministry on your behalf. I want to massage you a bit, but I'm coming hard on you later. Expect pastoral care from us. Expect us to care for you, to nurture you, to feed you, so that you can grow to be healthy Christians. But there's a place where you need, having grown in the faith, you need to be mature enough and take responsibility and be the salt and the light of the earth and be equipped to be able to impact your space. Have impact where God has positioned you. We are here to equip you so that you can be able to do the work to which God has called you. Do you know you're called? You're called into the kingdom of God, the first calling. Calling of salvation. You've been redeemed from the world. You are a child of God. But the second calling is go. Shine your light. Be his witness. A witness of his resurrection. A witness of his saving power. A witness of the light of Christ in your space where God has placed you. So train and guide you. Please be guidable. Is there, is there such a word? Guidable. There. <laughs> we love you people. But there are people who can be just difficult. <laughs> They are not guidable. They know it all. They just tell you how you should do, do stuff. But we are here to guide you. No amen. I said I will massage you, massage you, but I also be a little bit. Be guidable. Be teachable. Sometimes take spiritual instructions. Allow yourself to be guided. Amen. Amen. As shepherds, we are expected to support and to protect you. Support and protect you. We endeavor to support you. Forgive us where we may have failed to be able to be that spiritual support you needed. Because that sometimes happens. Either because we do not know or we are not aware or sometimes it's not practical. So we are supposed to support you. Be also supportable. Be supportable and protectable. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. I'm putting it lightly, but I mean what I'm saying. <laughs> you got to be protectable. Allow yourself to be protected spiritually. How do we protect you spiritually? We pray for you. We guide you. In terms of danger, just like the old shepherds in the Bible did. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Nehemiah 4, 14 is about the rebuilding of the wall. And after I looked, th I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Jesus declares that the true shepherds sacrifice their lives for the sheep even in the face of danger. 
John 10, 12 to 13. The hired hand is not the shepherd. Sorry, the hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolves attack or attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for, for the sheep. A hiring will take off. His security is paramount, not the security of the people he leads. And one way we seek to protect you spiritually is to warn you. All right? We warn you about the danger that lacks spiritually. As I have said, not all kind of preaching in this country and the world over is healthy spiritual food. Be able to discern what is good for your consumption. Don't consume things wholesale. You know whole grain? You take it whole, wholesome. Process things. Weigh things. And we are here to warn you so that you don't go into danger territory. You don't land into bad hands. That's one way we seek to protect you and to guide you as your shepherd. So we warn you against some doctrinal errors and heresies. And the apostle did that over and over again. He rebuked some people to their face and he warned them about false teachings and doctrines that are being propagated. Then the script has not changed since. We still have false prophets, false apostles, false pastors, and false teachers who wants to take advantage of you and swindle you. Can I tell you some things? We cancel some of you. We cancel you. And you come from time to time and you share with us. And some of you have fallen into some hands of hirings. They are after your money. They will give you a word purported from the Lord. And they are seeking payment. They are wanting to control your life. And some people are so spiritually confused. We warn you. We admonish you. We seek to direct you so that you don't go into harm's way. No amens. Fourthly, the shepherds should rescue and discipline straying sheep. What did I say? Discipline. Rescue and the ancient Mideast shepherd carried both the rod and the staff. The rod was to correct the indisciplined sheep. And the staff was to rescue the stray ones. There were actually two sticks, one longer than the other. The staff was hooked like this, a bit longer. That is to rescue the sheep from the pit or from where it has gone astray. But the, 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 the shepherd also had a rod almost this long. It was heavy, okay? Well-treated to discipline. <laughs> to administer discipline to the sheep that goes astray. Some sheep can become quichua. Stubborn. Quichua, for those who don't understand, means quichua. For those that become stubborn, the shepherd used this, the, the road to discipline. But this was Corrective discipline so that the flock or the sheep can be restored. God, as a good shepherd, disciplines his flock. Psalm 23, 3. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 94, 12. Blessed is a man you discipline, O Lord. The man you teach from your law. Blessed is a man you discipline. Oh Lord, the man you teach from your law. Church leaders are expected to discipline the flock, big and small. 1 Timothy 5, 19 to 20. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder. Can I repeat that again? Do 
Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless, let's not close the window, okay? Unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove or rebuke before everyone. Ouch. Please protect us a bit, eh? The elder who sins or the pastor who sins, because these elders were pastors, okay? Elders are pastors. And all the elders said, Amen, you're pastors. So we are in it together. <laughs> so, but the elder who sins, or who is sinning, and sinning, this is a con present continuous, eh? It's like that's his habit. <laughs> He's a habitual sinner. The one who is sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. So congregation, don't bring accusation against your pastor or your elder unless there is substantive ground. There are two or three witnesses. I think the whole aspect is to protect the office of the pastor and the elder, and to give honor to one whose honor is due. Give respect to one whose respect is due. But if they sin, don't cover it. All right? Don't cover it. Just establish your ground and bring the matter before the other leadership so that the issue can be sorted out. There is an amen from somewhere. <laughs> I hope there are no issues. <laughs> A good, sh sorry, good shepherds encourage and celebrate their flock. A good shepherd or good shepherds should actually encourage and celebrate their flock. David greatly rejoiced over the love and the pride God as his shepherd had over him. Psalm 23, 5 to 6. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Indeed, every Shepherd should take pride in his sheep, especially those that are doing well. So when you're doing well, we should celebrate you, recognize you, thank God for you. Which shepherd wants to lead feeble sheep, sickling, weaklings? Uh-uh. We pray for your well-being. We pray that you do well. We pronounce the blessings of God upon you, that it will go well with you, that God will bless you in the city, God will bless you in the countryside, God will bless your coming in, God will bless your going out, God will bless your lying down, God will bless your rising up, God will bless the work of your hands, hallelujah, God will bless the fruit of your womb, hallelujah, that your children will be like olive shoots around your table, hallelujah, that God will bless your barns, that you overflow with the goodness of the Lord, because when you're doing well, the church is doing well, and the shepherd will also do well. We pray the blessing of God over your life. May it go well with you. I think we need to create more occasion to celebrate what God is doing in your midst. We should encourage and celebrate your people as God blesses you. Colossians 4, 12 to 13. Epaphras. That's a beautiful name for those who are expecting sons. <laughs> Epaphras. Who is one of you and a servant of Jesus Christ sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at, at Laodicea and Hylopolis. The implication is that leaders should identify and rejoice with their members and celebrate their special achievements. You know what I've realized? 
over my few years of pastoral ministry, naturally and generally, we tend to identify it's easier to mourn with those who are mourning. But rejoicing with those who rejoice, especially when promotion comes, there's something that comes in here between your mouth and your chest that seems to be denying you some air and comfort. It's called kewaru. <laughs> To, to, to find people who genuinely rejoices with your well-being and celebrates you is not easy. But morning, Paul Lesana, now with the social me media platform, oh no, not again. Paul Lesana, our prayers are with you. But to say congratulations, my brother, well done, is difficult. I say today I'm getting the lead off. We should celebrate the achievements of one another. Because that's a blessing of God. So rejoice with those who? That's Bible, okay? Rejoice with those who? Rejoice, but also you mourn with those who? Mourn. Is there someone you need to send a congratulatory message to? No yeses. The third question we want to consider this morning, congregation, is what precautions must leaders take in relating with their members? Any relationship has boundaries. Without boundaries, things can get messy. All right? What are the precautions? Shepherds must not materially exploit the sheep as your leaders, as your pastors, as your elders and deacons. We should not materially exploit you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God spoke harshly to shepherds who took undue advantage over their sheep for their own benefit. Ezekiel 34, 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only, the word, key word here is only, okay? Who only take care of themselves. Should not the sheep take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. Let me clarify that. You should actually slaughter, eat the animal as a shepherd. It doesn't say you shouldn't. But you should not only do that, but also feed them. You know, we can read scripture and understand it the way we want. Eh? Or read into scripture. Let me read this statement again. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only... That's the only... Job description you have. Slaughter, eat, feed. <laughs> and there are shepherds who do that. Slaughter, eat, and eat, feed. You should not, you should, who only takes care of themselves, should not the shepherds take care of the flock? In the ancient Israel, of course the shepherds took care of the sheep. They fed them. They would sear them. Uh, is it Sia or Shia? You know, I went to a DEB school. <laughs> District education. These academies, I didn't know about them. So once in a while, that anointing comes out. <laughs> they would shear, remove the wool, make clothes and linens to cover themselves and to keep themselves warm. That was okay. But that should not be done at the expense of taking care of their sheep. Even when they are malnourished, they are not healthy, you still want to enrich yourself through the same. You eat the cards, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of? This scripture is not saying do not Slaughter the animal. Do not share it. He's saying you should do that, but also take care of 
the animals. In fact, they'll give you better wool if you feed them. Okay? They'll give you better mutton if you take care of them. In contrast, Paul declares he did not exploit his followers. 2 Corinthians 12, 14 to 15. Now I am ready to visit you for the third time. And I will not be a burden to you. Because what I want is not your possessions, but you. After all, children should not have to save up for the parents, but parents for their children. So I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. The apostle was willing to spend and be spent on behalf of the congregation in Corinth. Secondly, Ministers should not demand or accept payment. The key word here is payment. Demand. The ministers should not demand or expect payment for the ministry to a member. So the key word here is, let me move on. Sorry, I... Okay, we're together. Is that big enough? I apologize. Those screens are not very visible. As I mentioned, we're going to do something about that. Amen? We are planning to come back to you with your help. We want beautiful daylight screens on those uh, side screens. Amen? Those ones have served God in their generation. So ministers should not demand in other words, when we bring ministry to you, we should not demand to be paid. And some ministers are doing it. There are some churches or some ministers, you cannot see them without an envelope. It's a practice that you can't come before the man of God empty-handed. The man of God has come God, eh? Because it's only God where you should not come. That's scripture. We should not demand payment. Naaman was healed of leprosy. He tried to pay Elijah. The key word here is pay for service rendered. Then you become a consultant. But the prophet adamantly refused. Second Kings 5, 15 to 16. The Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Jesus directed his disciples to minister to the needy free of charge. Matthew 10, 8, 8. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. The ministry is to be extended Freely. This is the philosophy of ministry at Christ is the answer. Ministries. Freely we have received, freely we give. That's why we don't charge in funeral services. Some places you hire a venue, we give them for free. We consider that to be a ministry to a hurting family. So you don't pay anything. To make it even better, the offertory collected in such a service is entirely given to the family to help them through uh, all those bills that needs to be offset. We don't take that as an opportunity to get an offering for the church. That is opportunity for ministry to a hurting family. Freely we have received, freely we give. We do that for both members and non-members. Their people don't even come to church. As long as somebody is bereaved and they want to use our facility, we don't even vet. You are bereaved? Come and use our facility. 
Do you have a pastor? No, I don't even go to church. We'll provide a pastor to minister to you and encourage you and make sure that the dead is buried. Freely we have received, freely we give. I'm aware that elsewhere you have to pay for the electricity, for the cleaning of the facility, and a little bit of margin on top. Matthew 10, 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. When Simon the sorcerer tried to purchase a sp spiritual gifts, the apostle rebuked him. Now, Simon the sorcerer had weird ideas. He thought that you can actually use your material influence to gain some spiritual advantage. Purchase the gift. Buy off the man of God. Let him give you what he has so that you can also say, receive. And someone receives. Touch and they fall down. You know, sorcerers operate in the spiritual powers of darkness. For them, impact is key. <laughs> That's how they trade and sell their merchandise. You give your client something that should go and work for them in their situation. When they saw the apostle was using a different approach and they were anointed and stuff was happening, they said, give us that one. I think that one will take our trade to the next level. We'll be positioned for impact. When Simon, saw, when Simon saw the spirit was, uh, was given at the laying on hands of the apostles' hands, he offered the money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay hands may receive <laughs> the Holy Spirit. It cannot be the Holy Spirit from a witch. It's an evil spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with your money. Mm. Leaders must not take sexual advantage of their members. Sexual immorality is one of the major factors that has destroyed service and ministry of many leaders. You know, as we minister, inevitably, People come close to one another. Oh, Paul, oh, yeah, the Lord bless you. You lay hands and you go beyond laying on of hands. That happens. It's very slippery ground. You, you have to be cautious that you don't take sexual advantage of the flock. Perhaps if there's any sin that has dogged, men and women in ministry is sexual sins. Sometimes we assume when you are anointed, you are insulated. Okay? You cannot be tempted. And so you throw caution to the wind. And before you know it, one thing leads to the other. And you are fallen. Great men and women of God have become victim of sexual impropriety because of not respecting this boundary. But I also know of cases where members who have evil intention, use of the devil, have led some men of God astray. You come for ministry, but you want some other ministry that is not permitted. Ishindweyo. One of the reasons God harshly judged Eli's sons who served as priests was their sexual immorality. These boys were a mess. 1 Samuel 2, 22. Now Eli was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Oh, no. Right in the house of God. Sexual immorality. Terrible. That's why Eli's household was judged 
harshly. Genesis 29, 39, rather 6 to 12. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. One day, he went out into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he, re but he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Joseph took off. There's a time when you don't need to negotiate. I told you, yeah, we'll be found out. Now what are you doing? Take off. You have to take off for your own spiritual survival. Finally, shepherds must not abuse their power over the sheep. Shepherds must not abuse their power over the sheep. Whereas spiritual leaders are granted authority over their members, and we have spiritual authority as your leaders. Okay, congregation, God has given us some spiritual authority over you as your leaders, but this must not be abused. Mark 10, 42 to 45, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentile, lord it over to them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be fast must be a slave of all. If, uh, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself, his life rather as a ransom for many. And of course, Luke 12, 42 to 46 is there for us. I think the final question, not the final, a subset of the third one, how are members expected now to relate with their leaders? We have taken time to consider how as leaders we ought to relate to you people. But now, Let's consider how you should relate to us as your leaders. Members should ensure that the teachings by their leaders are doctrinally sound. Hmm. In other words, you have a God-given responsibility to keep us at check doctrinally. If a man of God preaches something that is heretical or is not sound biblically, please ask him. Pastor, you, you say that thing. What is that in the Bible? Is that consistent with the teaching of the word of God? You have that responsibility. Just in case you didn't know. All right? That's enormous power you have. I don't think you seem to appreciate this. <laughs> To keep our as check. The Bereans were amazing Christians. Acts 17, 11. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures. Every day to see if what Paul said was true. These guys respected the apostle. They knew he was called. He, they knew he was anointed. But they said, okay, whatever the apostle says, we will go and check. All right? So his spiritual authority did not intimidate them. They processed what he said. And that's your responsibility. Check what is being preached, whether it is fine doctrinally or whether it is correct or is an heresy. 
That's your responsibility. The second responsibility for you as members is members are expected to pray for their leaders. You are expected to pray for us. It's wonderful to pray for you and we pray for you. We have a godly duty and responsibility to pray for you. But you also have a God-given duty and responsibility to pray for us. Do you pray for your pastors? Please keep praying. Pray for your pastors. That's your responsibility. On several occasions, the apostle requested for prayers as they, as they served in the ministry. There are several ways you can pray pray for your spiritual leaders. One, pray generally for the leaders. 1 Thessalonians 5.25 Brethren, pray for us. Secondly, pray for open doors for ministry and for clarity in preaching the gospel. Now, how can you know what to pray for unless you are aware of what is happening in the ministry? You cannot pray effectively with understanding with knowledge unless you are aware of what is happening in the ministry and one way of being aware what of what's happening is attending an annual general meeting i had to find a way of dropping that on you <laughs> you'll get many more prayer points as an intercessor okay so you know how you pray for the ministry Pray for us, brethren. Colossians 4, 3 to 4. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Boldness. What is he saying? Pray for boldness. Pray for anointing. Pray for the empowerment to preach the gospel Boldly. So when the pastor is not anointed, whose problem is it? You said it, the flock. <laughs> I'm trying to drive home the point that you need to pray for us. If we are not anointed, it's not our problem. <laughs> it's because you have not prayed for us. That's not to say we don't pray, we pray. But if you prayed for us, boldness, anointing, Direction, miracle signs and wonders will happen when the church of Jesus Christ rises up to stand in the gap for its leaders. God will take us to a new direction. I know doors will open. God will do amazing things. Doors open. Remember the church that was praying in Acts chapter 4? Doors were open. Chains were broken. And Peter was released. There are many breakthroughs that we deny ourselves because of not praying. It's our duty and our responsibility to pray for the leaders of the church. Amen. Number three, pray for the general welfare and the protection of the leaders. You see, your leaders are on the forefront. When the devil wants to mess up with the ch church, he directs his missiles to the shepherd. You strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Is that serious? If the leadership is not protected, if the leadership is struck, if the leadership loses direction, the congregation, the church will scatter. Pray that God will protect the leadership and that God will give us direction and that we hear from him and that he will anoint us even for greater service. Can I show you statistically how you need the reality of pastoral ministry? This is for free. It's not in your manuals. I was just going to, I was studying the status of the, the, the pastoral ministry and my heart was broken. We don't have a lot of statistics on this side of the continent or even in Africa. But the West is very keen in research and documentation of professions and what is happening and trending. So these statistics are largely drawn from the U.S. of A. 
and this is by Banner Research, which is one of the most credible research uh, institutions. Listen to what this research found out regarding pastoral care. 90% of the pastors report working between 55 to 75 hours per week. That's killing oneself. 55 to 75. The average working hours in a day is 8. In a week, ideally one should work for 40 hours. Most pastors in the U.S. of A report working between 55 and 75 hours per week. Now, if you heard when they have cashers, the hours are even less. 80% 80, 80 believe pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. Can you imagine? 80% of the pastors believe that pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. Many pastors' children do not attend church now because of what the church has done to their parents. Sometimes the pastors pay a heavy price. They lay down their lives. They sacrifice their time for family to be able to attend to the flock. And some of their children have become delinquent because they think this church has taken away their dad or their mom. So they will resent anything to do with the church and become rebellious. 33% state that being in ministry is an outright hazard for their family. Can you imagine? 33% of the pastors sampled say being in ministry is an occupational hazard. Fifty percent feel unable to meet the demands of the job. In other words, fifty percent of the pastors feel inadequate to be able to address and minister to the people to which God has placed them in authority to serve. Ninety-four percent of the clergy families feel the pressure of the pastor's ministry. This is staggering. 94%, almost a hundred percent of the pastor's family feel the pressure of the pastor being in ministry. It looks far. It looks good from far. It is far from good. Don't be cheated by the glitter and the glamour and the red carpet. 70% say they have a lower self-image. Now that they have, sorry, 70% say they have a lower self-image now than when they first started. What are you hearing? If 70% of the pastor's self-image has taken a beating, what is it saying? They feel they're not performing. Maybe they've been criticized. They feel they're not meeting people's needs. They're discouraged, in other words. 70% also do not have someone they consider a close friend. That broke my heart. 70% of the pastors have nobody they consider to be a close friend. Even in mega churches, the bigger the church, the worse the statistics. After the pulpit ministry, the pastor retires home and is all quiet and lonely. They have to deal with how to put bread on their table, how to make ends meet. And we are talking of a fast world, by the way. If it was Africa, one would uh, understand. This is America. 33% confess having involved in inappropriate sexual behavior with someone in the church. Is it a, a wonder? Is it a wonder? 33% have been involved in sexual misconduct in the church. Hmm. 50% have considered leaving the ministry in the last months. Half of the pastors have contemplated quitting ministry. And 50% of the ministers start 
starting out will not last five years. 50%, half of the pastors who begin ministry do not continue to their fifth year in ministry. In another statistics conducted, churchleaders.com, why pastors quit ministry, this will help you to know how to pray for the pastors. I said I'm going to be real, okay? Every lead off. One, why pastors quit ministry? One, discouragement. Complaints speak louder than compliments. You can receive 15 compliments, but one complaint will stick. You forget about the 15 compliments, you only remember one complaint. Or the complaint will speak louder than the compliments one has received. The second factor why pastors are quitting ministry, failure. It may be moral failure or just failure to meet the expectation of the congregation, or failure to measure up. Thirdly, loneliness. This is independent research. That correlates with what I mentioned earlier. Everybody looks up to the pastor. The pastor has nobody to look up to. Sometimes we assume we are superhuman. We have everything. We can figure out. We can pray. But you discover... There's nobody to look up to. So there's loneliness in the ministry. The higher you go, the cooler it becomes. I like what you said, a lady from there. We forget that pastors are human. Fourthly, pastors' moral failure is more magnified than that of an average Christian. Cindy, hey, even that man of God. An average member can sin and get away with it, but when a pastor does it, it is amplified. It's breaking news. Fifthly, financial pressure. Financial pressure. I don't need to expound that. Number six, anger, disappointment. Seven, burnout. Pastors just keep going from hospital visit, from conducting a wedding, from preaching. They keep on going and going and going until they burn out. Burnout is real in the ministry. You keep giving and giving and giving. If you don't have time to feed, guess what? You can't go so far. Soon the passion goes. Soon the excitement, the enthusiasm goes. You begin to burn out. Number eight, physical health is one reason why pastors are quitting ministry. Many pastors overwork themselves and, and they don't simply take care of their bodies. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and God is very clear in his word. We need to take care of this body. But we somehow we think because you are anointed, you keep on going and going and going. You don't take care of your body. You don't exercise. You don't eat well. You don't rest well. And you go out until you actually burn out. You have healthy challenges. Pastors have dropped while preaching the gospel from the pulpit. Some pastors have been hospitalized because of fatigue and burnout. The body just riots. Number nine, marriage and family problems. Even pastors have family problems. They do. And sometimes families take a back seat because the pastor is married to the church. They're not married to the family. Finally, too busy. Not working smart. This is our own making, okay? We don't know how to say no. You don't want to disappoint people. So we don't have a clear calendar and shield you to know when do I take my Sabbath? When do I rest? When do I switch off the phone and say for the next six hours I'm receiving no phone calls. I want to sleep. I want to rest. I want to pray. I want to wait on God. I want to do something different so that I can be renewed and be energized. We don't know how to work smart. We just respond as occasion demands. We are actually on call 24-7. So 
So you know how to pray for your pastors. You know how to pray for your pastors and the leaders. Finally, I need to conclude this. Our time is gone. Where were we? See. <laughs> pray. That's how you should pray for your pastors. Number four. Respect. Members should respect and honor their leaders. We should respect and honor our leaders. Whereas leaders should not demand recognition. Instead, conduct themselves with humility. Members are, however, expected to hold their leaders in due esteem. Romans 13, 7. Give everyone what you owe him. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. 1 Timothy 5, 17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. The implication is that members should honor their leaders and not deal casually or disrespectively with them. There are times I've come to an annual general meeting and my heart has been broken. I know we live in a democratic society. You have a right in an annual general meeting to air your views, and you should air your views, okay? It's feedback. You can interrogate, you can inquire, you can suggest, you can give advice. That is well provided for in the constitution of the church and in the constitution of heaven and in the word of God. But to address a bishop, to address an elder disrespectively is unacceptable in the church. This AGM is going to be different. We are not trying to stifle your opinion. Air it respectively. It will build the church. Because we don't know it all. Some of the most amazing things that have built me up is when I get feedback both positive and not so good. But done with love and respect. I take that and it helps me a lot. So let's honor the one whom honor is due. I really believe there are special blessings that people get when they respect their leaders and treat them as such. When you receive a prophet, in the name of a prophet, there is a reward you get for that. When you honor those in authority, God will honor you. God will bless you in amazing ways. So let's come with suggestions and opinion and advice, but do it in an atmosphere of love and respect. Number four, members should support their leaders in ministry. Leaders often mean, sorry, need men and women who can help them with the work of the ministry. And Paul had several such individuals who stood with him in service. And he mentions them along text there, Colossians 4, 7 to uh, 17. You can make reference there later. Number five. Members should support their leaders. Sorry, did you get that? Members should support their leaders. Fifthly, members may materially bless their leaders. And God's people said, Members may materially bless their leaders. Every once in a while, individual members may choose to bless their leaders with special gifts. Such gifts must be freely and voluntarily given and separate from tithes and offerings. Don't take your tithe to bless the man of God. Okay? Hey. The tithe comes to the storehouse of God. If you want to bless a pastor, if you want to bless an elder who has ministered to you or who, whom God has impressed upon your life to be able to bless, go ahead and do it. It's very biblical. All right? Hey, no amens. It's Bible. You may bless your leaders materially as God leads you. Can I confess from time to time, some of you have blessed us materially. And God bless you. This is not to put pressure on anybody. Okay? 
No pressure intended. Today I said I'm taking off the lead. We have been beneficiaries of your blessings. But we have not come to solicit. What is wrong is to come and start soliciting for favors. But if God leads you to bless, go ahead and do so as God may lead you. Matthew 27, 55 to 56. Many women were there watching from a distance. They followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among these were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. These women just loved on Jesus. They poured expensive oil. They washed his feet. They fed him. They cooked for him as he did his ministry. Finally, as we finish, practices, practices members should guard against as they relate with their leaders. The relationship between members and their leaders requires that they exercise caution so as to uphold the integrity of the relationship. Number one, Members must not worship their leaders. You know that happens? Members should not worship their leaders. Sometimes leaders can, greatly, can be greatly used of God and become so powerful that members begin to adore them, the mighty man of God. So you are left to wonder who is mighty, God or the man? All true messengers of God always refuse to receive such adoration. Secondly, members should not possess a leader. Okay? You should not possess a leader. How does that happen? Sometimes members tend to own a spiritual leader and at times buy their loyalty. This is not acceptable since the leader is expected to serve all under his or her care equally. Do not possess a leader or a pastor. In conclusion, we have no time to re revisit the, 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 the last question for discussion. Developing healthy relationship between spiritual leaders and their members require a delicate balance that maintains the honor and the dignity of both the leader and the members. Both the leader and the members must stand firm and alert so that they do not abuse or undermine such a relationship. I invite us to stand in the presence of God congregation. That was a long message. I hope it has helped you to clarify a few things. At least gain an understanding of how this relationship between the pastor, the leader, and the flock should be nurtured. I believe that God wants to use this relationship to bless the church. God wants this relationship to be a blessing to the body of Christ and for the advancement of the body of Christ and advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you whisper a prayer as we even bring this service to a close? Whoa, 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 whoa,